Mr. Comerford? Here. Mr. Evans? Here. Mr. Mercurio? Here. And Mrs. Weiss? Here. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I need a motion for the approval of the agenda, including the agenda that was um, sent out. So, seconded. Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Is that, did Mr. Evans make the motion, please? Yes, it was, Mr. Evans. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Mr. Um, Mr. Evans? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Mr. Mercurio? Aye. And Mrs. Weiss? Do we have any resident participation today? I have not received any resident resident participation um, notifications today, Mrs. Weiss. All right, thank you. All right, on to the superintendent's agenda, Mr. Forstoffel. Uh, did we want to do meeting protocol, Mr. Oh, Weber? so sorry, I'm just okay. over. Sorry. We're so used to doing this now. I'm, Mrs. Weber, can you please review the meeting protocol for, um, for us, please? Thank you. Sure, thanks everyone. Um, we are, as um, has become our typical practice, uh, the board is um, in attendance today at the board meeting, but we are also um, providing a virtual setting for our, our Board of Education meeting. Um, if you need to access the agenda for the meeting, it is can be found, uh, Mr. Lewis, if you could go to the next slide. can be found on our Board of Education page where you can find both the agenda, the posting, and then once minutes are approved, um, the, um, the minutes can be found on this page. Um, the virtual participants today, if you have questions or comments, we have two moderators today, Mr. Lewis and Mr. Fritz. Um, they can, number one, um, forward that information to either myself or the Board of Education as needed. Um, we do we do have the chat available today in our Zoom meeting. We ask you only to use that um, in the event of technical difficulties, so we know if we're having issues with sound or video or those types of things. So, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Mrs. Weiss. Great, thank you, Mrs. Weber. All right, on to the superintendent's agenda, Mr. Forsbach. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Weiss. Just a quick update. Uh, just our standard practice for our healthy age update. So. Before I get into the two slides, and we've gone from like 40 slides to two slides, um, but let me just give a, a quick shout out to our students and staff um, that really uh, started our second semester in a seamless fashion. I'm very proud, uh, even though we got our second semester off on a little delay Monday morning, um, but uh, I'm very proud. Um, it's business as usual in this unusual time. So I'm very excited and proud of everything that's going on in the buildings and our students are off to a great start second semester. So many, many thanks and accolades to the to our people in the buildings that have made this work in the interest of our students. So I have two quick, not really quick updates, but I have two um, significant updates that are the focus of a lot of our work right now around COVID. And that's certainly our vaccination plan uh, for our staff. As, as the board knows, uh, School staff are part of phase uh, 1B, um, and now 1B is upon us. And so we were charged with identifying a partner um, that would assist us and help us with the administration of vaccine for our staff. There were many options um, that we had in front of us. We've selected a partner that, first of all, we're comfortable with, we have a long history with, and our health experts. Um, that's not being negative to the other partners on the list, but there's a certain level of comfort with TriHealth. And we've selected TriHealth as our registered vaccination provider uh, for, for some of the reasons I just mentioned. But one of the reasons is, is that they've been doing this in the community for upwards of five weeks. So they have a very clear and defined system for doing it. Um, and it became clearly evident in our planning with them that they have a really refined system for doing it. So basically, TriHealth will coordinate and organize the distribution. And I will share that we put out a pretty broad-based communication to staff yesterday to give them an update. And I've been communicating pretty significantly and regularly with our association leadership to keep them in the loop on that. So basically, we've requested 
800 doses, and that's based on our vaccination intent form that we've been given our staff. Um, so we're in good shape there. We've been hearing that um, we expect Tri-Health to receive that amount of dose for us, which would allow us to take care of our staff at one time. But, there, but we, we can't really commit to that, right? We believe that that's gonna happen, but we have to, we're not entirely sure that it's gonna happen, but we're confident, let's just put it like that. Um, we hear from Tri-Health that they're expected to receive their allotment as soon as next week, which is in alignment with what we've been hearing. So now it's a process of figuring out when the administration is actually going to happen. And in our conversations Monday night with Tri-Health, um, we're still working on the actual distribution date, but it's likely based on their experiences is to be done on a weekend. And that's a good thing for us. So they will identify the sites in, in our community and it'll be Tri-Health sites simply because of, they're gonna utilize their staff and their equipment and their storage um, to make sure that they handle the vaccine. But the sites will be in our community. So logically, you can imagine what those sites might be for us. And the initial conversation was is that they are committed um, to doing a 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Saturday and Sunday for people to come in and get their vaccine. There'll be a process by which staff will have to set up basically what's called a MyChart account. Some of you may know what a MyChart account is. It's a simple account that you set up with your healthcare provider, um, and it's a way for them to actually then get on and schedule an appointment through trial. Simple process. We're going to work our staff through that, give them clear directions on how to do that. I have a couple, so it's not a hard thing to do. Um, and then TriHealth will coordinate uh, the appointment uh, for the vaccinations. Once you get that vaccination, the first round, you will then schedule your next one which is a good thing, right? So there's no indecision or uncertainty about when, when that will happen. So right now, here is what we are doing. We have put out a survey, I think last week, to ask, ask staff to ensure that we know who's committed to getting it. There's some information we need to provide to try out and we need to have that to them by Friday. We asked staff to commit by noon yesterday. We are now working through that list you know, there's some other uh, groups of staff that we're working with, like long-term subs, coaches that are not regular employees. So we're working through all of those things to make sure we've got everybody taken care of. And then we will submit that data file to try help by Friday, okay? At that point in time, sometime this week, we'll give information to staff about how to set up that account, that MyChart account, and then the scheduling process takes place, okay? One of the things that we're committed to doing, and we did that yesterday with some basic information to staff, is creating a frequently asked question. There's a lot of questions. If I've had COVID, can I get the vaccine? You can imagine what all the questions are. We're working through all of those right now because we want people to understand what are the ins and the outs of getting this vaccine. We're very confident that this is going to go very seamlessly because I have a lot of confidence in tri health based on their leadership team that we discussed with. And, and I think it's gonna go well. So um, that's a lot of the work that we're doing. There's several people on this call, three of which I can see right now, Beth and Chad and Stacy. Mallory's been involved, Mrs. Farron has been involved, Mr. Foster have put a, a tremendous amount of time um, into making sure this is a fluid process. And I'm very proud of them. It's a lot of work, um, but we know it's really important that we get this done and we get it done right. We also want to make sure we communicate to the community. And the community needs to know that we're going to take care of our teachers and staff, and so they need to know when that's going to happen. So look for that, you know, maybe by the end of the week. Okay, so that's where we're at with that. Let me pause on that. One. Any questions that you have? So is everyone, every employee that works for the school district eligible to yes. get the vaccine? Yes. Okay. Yes. And are you confident that there's going to be enough vaccines for all those that want it? I am confident. Yes, I am confident. Now, when we get it all at once, yeah. I'm somewhat confident. But if not, um, we will get it at some point. I mean, and and Trump has even said that if they need to roll over into a following weekend, they can do that. Okay. Okay. Mr. First off, well, do you have any concern about having more of a staggered 
vaccination programs so that everybody's not getting vaccinated on one weekend so that you know, there has been some reports that after the second dose, people are experiencing yep. mild symptoms and what that might do in terms of the impact yep. of the school, you know, to teaching and et cetera. Great question. So let me, let me talk about the first level first. If our schedule holds and we're able to do the vaccinations, let's say not this weekend, but next weekend, Monday, we're a day off. It's President's Day, so we're good there. If we fast forward then, to the next round, and if TriHealth commits to their weekend, then we may have to look at what, what may be the Monday after, knowing that the second dose typically is a little bit more. So the options in front of us could be a remote day, or if, I, if we have to, a calamity day. The decision I need to make is, you know, even if we don't have, if, if we have enough information that says our staff is gonna be impacted, or enough staff are gonna be impacted with side effects, are they going to be able to teach remotely, right? Yeah. You know, I, you know, my daughter is an example. She got the second round because she works for a health organization and, and it knocked her out for a day. Okay. So are teachers able to teach remotely? If, you know, so those are some of the issues. I, and I'd like to err on the cost side of caution for that, obviously. And I think our community would understand. They care deeply for our teachers and our staff, and they would feel ultimately confident that we're taking care of getting the next a good question, thank you, Mr. Forstoff. Yeah, is the expectation that they can get it all done on one weekend and enough sites and mobile storage? That's what we're hearing now, yeah, yeah. And I think that that uh, kind of begs the question, Mr. Evans, about why on their site, okay? They've got this so efficiently organized that we're confident, um, and it, it, re it may be dependent upon uh, how many sites they use. You know, obviously, we've got the mothership, B North, but we've also got the pavilion right over here. That they may utilize whatever ones. What was also good for me as I looked at the list and I had the whole list of all the county schools, private and public, that were selecting their providers. A lot of county schools selected Kroger, good for Kroger, but there was a mass volume. And then I looked at who partnered with Trium, a very finite group of people. Okay, very finite, us and maybe a couple of private schools. So, what does that say? We're going to get, we're, we're going to be in a good group. So, yeah, a lot of details to work out, but we're confident our team was on with Tri Health probably like till 7 30 Monday night. Um, and we came out of that conversation feeling incredibly confident that we're going to get this done. Mr. Parsoff, if, if a staff member says no and then changes their mind in the next week, is that a possibility or no? They had to put a final answer. They had to put a final answer. So there's there's questions about, and we're still working through these, Mr. Ballot. Um, you know, if, if you're in quarantine and you know, can you get it? Oh, we're working through all those details. What we're hearing from TriHealth is they've committed to working with each individual staff member, and if they have a unique circumstance, that they'll make sure that they get them the vaccine. Okay. That also is a good thing. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay. So we've got some work to do. Uh, and, and you know, I um, I acknowledge the fact that this is an emotional topic for people. I get it. Our teachers and staff have done amazing work, um, and we're going to do everything we can to take care of them, so they can feel confident um, with this process. And I feel confident in the process, and I believe my team does as well. So, um, Mr. Parsons, are we still seeing that roughly eighty percent number that you showed us? Yeah, it was it was upwards of eighty five percent. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. and that really speaks well. I, I'm I'm thrilled with that. You know, so I would agree. Thank yeah, you. so that's good news. Okay, any other questions on that? Would it be possible for the board to see the the frequently asked questions sure. and some of the communication that's yeah. gone out? To the Did staff? you not get the one that went to staff yesterday? I I are you guys in the queue on that? I, I got that, and I think we all got the first survey, but I don't know if there was a second survey that I didn't. The get commitment? Did you get the commitment one? No. Okay, the suspense or not? Well, we'll get that. To you. Well, well, there was a first survey saying if there is a vaccine available. This was a while ago. Yeah, right. But there hasn't been. I haven't gotten anything. I didn't see that. anything yesterday. Okay. All right. We will clean that up. Thank you. No, no, I get it. Okay. So it's a lot to manage. We'll I just wanted to make sure that. I did get the second one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 We'll clean it up. 
All right. Well, thank you to everybody for doing that work. I know that the coordination of this is extremely involved. And um, on behalf of the board, just to thank everybody who's been working on that. I know Tri Health has been a partner of ours for a long time. And I think you're right, Mr. Forstoff, that that comfort level is going to um, provide um, a lot when these um, vaccines get administered. Yep. So thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. And then finally, I'll just very quickly, because I know we've got other stuff to do. So, Mr. Whoever's running the board can go to the next slide. There we go. So again, I'll just kind of briefly share where we're at with planning for 2021. Um, and I, this is pretty clear that I've shared this with, we've got teams working on, you know, what next year is gonna look like in relationship to learning models. And, and as I've shared before, it's really a two scenario, two train, uh, two parallel paths. One, if we have um, physical distancing still in place, we don't know that. And two, if we do not, then if we're back to somewhat a normal, and what that's going to look like in terms of our virtual student offerings or virtual learning options. So we're working through some of those, some ideas that we're thinking of. Right now, we're kind of thinking about the planning as kind of a K6, 7, 12 buckets uh, because they're somewhat different. You know, as you know, then in K6, um, you know, we've had dedicated space for virtual learning, or 7, 12, it's been a lot of hybrid live streaming, those kinds of things. So Right now, our path right now is the K6, 7, 12, and we're kind of looking at it in two buckets. What have we looked at this year that we want to keep? And what is it we may want to think about either adding or deleting from what we've done this year? And when I say deleting, I'm not saying minimizing what we're going to do, but we've got to look through all of that. Um, you know, that last statement on there, potentially we have to look at what the, what the electives are going to look like. I'm not saying that's the way it's going to go, um, but, you know, if, if we're in somewhat of a normal fashion, are we able to offer the breadth and depth of what we did this year because of other factors? So um, we're working through all of that right now. We'll keep the board updated. We'll bring that back to you um, in every week. So one question, yep. I see that the, the first day of school is August 30th, yes. which is a couple weeks about from where we typically sure. started the year. And yep. One question that I have is, do we think that that's going to have any kind of an impact on any of the amount of curriculum that needs to be covered or preparing for tests that have sort of set dates, whether it's for high school students, ACT, AP tests, things like that, like starting two weeks late, how does that impact, does that impact any of that as and it's your academic team yeah. concerned about that? Well, I think what the impact would be is that our teams then would look at their curriculum maps and kind of making sure that they um, look at the power standards to make sure that they map out what they need to cover prior to whatever testing that they're preparing for. Our teams are good at that. They know how to do those kinds of things. Okay. They'll adjust their maps and their schedules based on the, the overarching school calendar. Okay, great. Yeah. A question I have. Yeah. All scenarios offer a virtual learning option for next year? Yeah, we are considering, uh, if your question is, is that? Is that the idea? Yeah, I think one of the things we want to think about, Mr. McCurio, is that let's assume for a moment that we are back to whatever normal is, right? Let's say we don't have a distancing element. Okay. Do we offer some kind of remote option for maybe students that, um, this is the best way to learn along the continuum. We have some examples of that right now. We have Abe's Academy, we have other things, but should we also look at for maybe that more finite group of students that remote learning may be the best option for them? We have something in place for them. Knowing that a vast majority of our, our kids, if we don't have the, the, the distance, you know, we'll come back to school. So what we're learning is, is that for some of our kids, this really worked, you know? And, and there may still be some element, regardless of where we're at come August, that there may be some element of concern, apprehension, and some families about even coming back then. Don't know that yet. Eventually, at some point, we're going to have to reach back out in the community. I understand including that as an option in planning. But I think we got to also remember that being in school is more than just it works for student achievement you know, coming to school. Yeah. And fostering relationships and growing up as an adult is an important component of going to school. And I, uh, yeah, I, I have no argument with that. Thanks. 
Who's leading the virtual learning? Our whole team, the curriculum team's leading it. We've got principals working through it. I'm deeply involved with it. Um, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Um, I think the sentiment among our building leaders is, you know, we need to really think about what a virtual option could be, regardless of, of what our status looks like. You know, don't know exactly what that is, but we, I think it's, I think it's important for us to go through the process and figure that out. Okay, I know we have some newer members on the board. I think it might be good to rehash what Aves Academy is and how that works for our students and where this overlaps or doesn't overlap that option. Okay. Mr. Vorstoffel, the um, district did a, and you, everyone, did an admirable job of um, staffing up for the scenario that we're running this yep. year with um, new teaching, new teachers. I'm curious between scenario one and scenario two, what do they look like from a staffing requirement? And have we looked at that? And do we have a high level at least uh, understanding of what that might mean between those two? Uh, we do not, but that's that's priority 1A. Okay. Um, because, and, and what I will share with, obviously the board did such a good job of giving us the resources to do what we're doing right now. But we need to look at the impact of whatever scenario in terms of staffing and what that means from a budgetary impact. We know that. We get that. And we need, we'll do that checkpoint with you moving forward. So we've got a follow up conversation coming really soon to look at parallel conversations, what staffing might be um, from a broad level. Um, you know, and understanding that you know, checkbook's not always. Ready, right? And, and can you remind me the contracts we had for the additional staff that we brought on? Was that an annual? Yeah, they're 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 called replacement contracts, Mr. Comfort, and that at the end of this school year, those contracts are automatically not renewed, so they're really one year contracts. Okay. Yeah. So if we if we didn't have any foresight, which way that would help us if we wanted to have continuity or retention of some of those one year contracts? Yeah, that I think that speaks to our planning need. To figure out what we're going to need, and if there's a, if there's some teachers within that group that we want to retain, we need to know that. Yeah, that makes sense. But there's no obligation to a, a vast majority of those teachers that we hire to implement this plan beyond year one. I think, Mr. Forster, Mr. Comerford, I would just, and Mr. Forstoffel, I would just add that that was a one-year. Um, agreement that we work through with our teachers association. So that would be something that would need to be um, revisited should we, we want to have a similar setup for this coming for the next year. I think too in this in this uncertain year, we, it was very important to um, our leadership that we were able to give families an option sure. of the virtual versus the face to face. Um, I think as we've seen in, in the high school over many years, there is a, there is, um, a recommendation day, which has been in a typical year. It's where teachers say, you know, I think you, Mr. Evans, should be taking this math class and you, Mr. Balance, should be taking that math class based on their performance. And I'm wondering if we can include or have some um, teacher input in terms of students that have really done well in a virtual environment and maybe students that they think may benefit more from being in an in-person environment and that can just be part of what we do going forward. Not to say that that's a binding thing, but just a recommendation based on what they've seen over the, the last year. Because I think like you said, Mr. Forstoffel, some students have thrived in the virtual environment and I think others you know, have, have struggled and how do we kind of balance that and give give parents and students feedback like this might be a better model for you or this model is working great for you. Yeah, we actually talked about that building leaders expressed some interest in that. We do that, we're doing it now, you know, with, with some families where yeah. we recognize our building leaders, and not just the leaders, our, our staff are strong advocates for getting kids in the right place at the right time. And, and there's been probably more conversations than I know between school and family about, you know, we based on what we know about your child and what we've experienced, we think this model might be better. Right. Uh, I, I would suspect our out of the seven buildings, those conversations are littered with those conversations in a good way, right? And advocating and service for kids. So yes, you're right. We've had that conversation. Okay. 
Yeah. Well, so I just want to echo um, Mr. Weiss's comments on, you know, looking forward to next year and just trying to figure out, you know, there's enough time in the year. I know I brought it up last year. Um, but it seems to be maybe a recurrent theme if we go into the planning for next year. You know, do we have enough time in the calendar? We've already shortened the front end. I know we extended the back end, but do we just need more time? So maybe we provide an update on a lot more clarity around the, the, the mapping process so you can kind of get a feel for how teachers approach. Well, I think it has to do with sort of the data going through the year. You know, as you get through the year, you know, um, you know, it's been a challenging year and it's doing the best that they can, but we might not be able to, you know, deliver all the content we really wanted to. Maybe we try to make up for some of that next year. I think it's really the motion, okay. at least from my standpoint. All right. Great. Thank um, you all. Appreciate 40 your page, feedback. 40 page update to a two page update, Mr. Perkins. Commendable. That's all right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, moving on, I need a motion for the approval of the 2021 2022 preschool tuition rate. So moved. Seconded, Paul. I will turn this over to Mrs. Weber, who's worked really hard on this. I, every year I kind of give you the graduating class. I can't even begin to tell you that. I don't, I don't know what that class is. 30 <laughs> something, maybe. Mrs. Weber. Thank you, Mr. Forstoppel. Um, we, in, in the same methodology that we use for kindergarten tuition, um, we look at the staff time that is um, focused on the preschool program and base um, a per pupil amount uh, for those students who are in a typical setting in our, our preschool programs um, and determine that uh, the tuition rate. Um, we're requesting a hundred dollar increase uh, for next year, and I, I will also add that for this year, because we did not have what would be um, typical uh, sections and attendance um, in our preschool program, we looked at what would be a more typical setting with eight, eight students per typical section um, participating in 21-22. Um, uh, this year, as opposed to, I think, what would normally be 64 kids in, in preschool, we have currently uh, 28 typical kids, um, but we, we look for that to, to come bouncing back next year when that program is available. Um, note that I think this may be the last year that we will not be able to have our expanded preschool program. Um, I think that either in 20. 22 or 2023, uh, we'll be able to extend our preschool program based on the new space we have available um, in our elementary schools. So we're going to be taking a look this year at uh, the program in general, I believe, but also just if there might need to be a different structure uh, for how we charge tuition for that program going forward. Ms. Weber, I ask this question every year. Um, is the tuition covering the cost for the typical students? Mr. Uh, Macario, it's, it's structured to cover the cost of the staff time for that program. We um, do not structure it to cover things like our uh, the transportation that's provided with the program because that transportation is provided anyway to support our um, students who would be, who are in our, uh, our students with disabilities who attend that program. The $100 increase does cover the expected increase in staff costs. If we're, if we're fully um, enrolled next year, which is our, our hope. Thank you. Any other questions for the board? All right, Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mr. Mercurio? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Mr. Evans? Aye. And Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of amendment number three, CMR agreement, HTC construction for Sims Elementary. So moved. Seconded. I will turn this over to Mrs. Weber and Mr. Lewis who will walk you through the CMR agreement with HTC. So <clears throat> not unlike um, the previous um, GMP amendments that we've asked you to approve, except for obviously this one is much larger. Uh, <clears throat> this is the remainder of 
the renovation work to the interior of Sims Elementary. The only thing that is not included in this budget is um, our furniture package that, again, we're not, <clears throat> we're not in any rush to do that, but it's something we're still working through um, <clears throat> as we adjust, um, you know, to the budget. But, you know, this was the big one that we needed to get in and to make sure that uh, we were able to secure uh, the building under the budget guidelines that we had set forth. So um, we are asking for your approval of GMP number three uh, to amend HGC's contract uh, for $7,619,243. Um, so uh, other than that, the only highlights that I would point out, uh, a couple of things that I think are important um, from our original budget there are two additional early childhood classrooms that after enrollment projections, the looking at the building, talking about the expansion of the building and the needs of the building, we felt that that was critical. So that was that cost was not in the original budget and did not get added to the original budget. It just was something that we had hoped through the bidding environment we could absorb as part of the bidding environment and, and part of the budget. The technology package, uh, we, we spent what I would consider a little more than a building of this size for uh, typical because based on Bill's recommendation and working through his team and working collaboratively with our uh, consultant Encore, they felt strongly that you know to retain some of the technology that was in the building, especially a circa 1989 built building, that it would make more sense to replace um, all of the technology, all of the wiring, all of the things and make those upgrades now that it would lend itself to being a less expensive than in the future. So we probably spent an additional 30 to 60,000 on technology in this area than versus the normal, um, I'm sorry, it should have been th 300,000 and 600,000, not 30 to 60,000, my, my apologies, but <clears throat> again, over a typical budget for a building this size. Um, I would say typically for a building this size, we would have probably estimated about 600, maybe 700,000 for the technology package. And, um, you know, we'll have to we dig out all the alternates and estimates, but we spent anywhere between 900,000 and $1.1 million on technology for the building. But you know, as, as we know, technology drives a lot of our work uh, within the building. So uh, certainly want to make sure that the building's ready and future proof. And Bill always keeps us on that uh, edge of where we want to be with our technology package. And then the other thing that I would say is, uh, you know, we had to take some alternates because we just weren't sure with the bidding environment to make sure would this fit with these items that teachers really wanted and you know, to really finish off the building the right way, uh, would we be able to finish uh, and get the budget where we needed it to be? So uh, we were able to accept a little over 300,000 in alternates, which again, for us to absorb nearly, you know, in my mind, a little over a million dollars in potential changes to the original budget but really what was needed for the building, I think it just speaks to where the bidding environment was before we had our, and when we did our estimates that were very conservative to now, <clears throat> what the bidding environment allowed us to accomplish. So in order to make the budget work, we did um, have a, a little budget offset of about $3,000 that we pulled out of, um, the furniture package to make the base budget work. Uh, that doesn't account for, uh, we still have nearly 600,000 in contingency dollars and we still have uh, some additional money uh, in our soft cost contingency as well. So um, ba based on the fact that we're nearly out of the ground at, at the facility, you know, those are a lot of the unknowns. There's not as many unknowns in the building. Um, <clears throat> I think we feel fairly confident that our budget is right on track. It's exactly what we needed for this project. And at the end of the day, we feel like we're going to get the project delivered to this community that they expected and deserve. So 
Um, Mrs. Weber, I don't know if you had any additional comments based on what I shared, but and I'm happy to entertain any questions that the board might have about this GMP number three. I have no additional comments, thanks. Any questions from the board? Yeah, Mr. Lewis, I've got a question on the um, technology budget um, that's up by about a half million dollars. What's the benefit of doing this from a content delivery or academic delivery focus? I, I can't speak to the academic benefits. Um, specifically from my standpoint, it was a financial decision. So uh, when you talk about going in and rewiring a building or upgrading all the wiring to the building, upgrading all the, uh, the six and seven year old security cameras, things like that, it's much easier to do when you've already got the ceiling and the um, areas ripped open and exposed to be able to upgrade all of those things while you're already renovating the building to go cost to those uh, upgrades. So uh, I, I, guess that, I, I understand that piece of it. I guess what I'm trying to figure out is what would you not be able to do if you didn't upgrade this wiring? I'm trying to figure out the real benefit because I know going from, you know, cat five to cat six wiring, which is I assume is what you're doing. Um, you know, from a technology standpoint and the information that you're trying to deliver over your routers, I don't think we're bandwidth limited. So I'm just trying to figure out, it's a nice to have, but do we need it? And I don't know if Bill's on the call. I, I don't know that I would specifically, I didn't work as closely with the designers of that package. Uh, so hey, Chad, this is Charlie. I can, I can help you on that. Um, it doesn't look like bills on either. Um, the, the original budget had new technology for the, the additions only. Uh, we were going to re utilize the existing technology in, within the existing SIMS. When Encore and Bill Fritz started to get into it, they realized this, the, the school would be, without a better term, cobbled together. You, you kind of have some 2010 era technology in the existing school building. And then on the additions, you'd have a 2020 era technology. And, and the recommendation came to redo all of it. And that's what we've bid today. Um, I also believe as you um, hinted that we are going to cat six, I believe they're doing an extra drop at each, wi at each Wi-Fi access point, knowing that Wi-Fi uh, connectivity is increasing. So in the future, if we need to add additional access points, that drop is already there. Um, so th th we're, we're taking recommendations from our technology designer to really, I'm not going to say future proof, but make it in 2030, where if we need to add more features for bandwidth, it's, it's easier, it's easier done. And does this mean we're going to do this for every school? And, and Bill just walked in at us. <laughs> right there, really. I mean, are we going to wind up with this sort of philosophy saying, okay, now every school is not new. So five other schools, are we going to wind up with? you know, half a million dollars, you know, two and a half, three million dollars of extra expense. The, the green school and junior high obviously will be designed in the same mentality. Um, the high school also will be, I think what we need to do is, is really look and see where where the gaps are at, at, at um, Maple Dale, Montgomery and Blue Ash, knowing, but knowing those are a little bit newer buildings anyway. So, um, and Mr. 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 Evans, what I would say is, um, the budgets that we've set forth and agreed to with Encore are on par with what we expected at the at the other facilities. So I and those designs are done. So I don't expect there to be this additional cost for a technology package at the other three buildings. Um, I even Charlie and Allison heard from me a couple of times that I just <clears throat> I I questioned the technology package several times, but once explained to me and, and really vetted out, it did make sense um, of what they were recommending if it fit in the budget. If, if it did not fit in the budget, that was one of the areas that we would have gone uh, to look at value engineering because, you know, again, we, <clears throat> we wanted to deliver the, the building that we thought would be the best going forward. Uh, green and junior high and high school, I think, again, we've, we've been able to do the things we believe need to be done at those buildings without expanding those budgets. But at Sims, being the fact that it was 
focused on the new portion of the building and then not the rest of the building as much, we did feel like we had to add the additional scope to be able to outfit the rest of the building. So, Bill, I don't know if you had any comments and I, I apologize that, you know, you weren't here for the beginning of the discussion, but the question was, what was the need for um, the expanded scope at Sims versus the original scope in the, uh, the additional expenditure for technology? Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> I don't know if we, so I came in in the middle of it, I apologize. But at Sims, we're doing a wing of the building and yet you can't just parse out one wing and try to then make all your interoperability work with your systems and your software, or excuse me, your hardware. So our switches, uh, overall, I mean, we're just going to update one portion of that in the phones. Our phones are now 2003 model. So we're now end of life completely with our phones. So we're now what you're finding is your new switches will not support that legacy uh, phone. So in general, overall, we're replacing our phones across the entire district as we upgrade our switches. We can't upgrade just part of that building. It's very simple when you go through the high school and you move through and you replace everything. Same thing with junior high and the green school, but it seems that'll be a challenge for us to do. Uh, I don't know if that's exactly the part of it, uh, Charlie, or not, but I don't know if you're hearing me uh, about that, but that's part of that, as well as when you talk about Blue Ash, Mapledale, and Montgomery, we're also looking at switch upgrades in normal. In general, Beth and I have been talking about this for the last three or four years. Every about eight years, we're going to upgrade all of our switches. We were waiting to say, when is that really a good time to do that? We could piggyback on, do I do that in front of or behind the construction or do it while the construction? So we're trying to work through that. Second piece of that is we're also leveraging our E-rate opportunity. So if you're familiar with that E-rate, it gives us 40% back on those purchases. If we get in that window, which is July 1 to September of 20, July 1 this year to September of 2022, we can purchase those switches. I've got them out for bid right now. We can get 40% of that back. So helping our costs on this project as well. Those switches not only are for Sims, but the junior high, the green school, um, and the high school. Obviously, we've got we've got switches in there for our other three buildings that are under construction. So just try to walk that path to very, very be financially sound about getting our 40% back, but also thinking about interoperability. Uh, you don't want to put two systems or one system in Sims that's different than the other systems, and how do we support that effectively? Charlie, I don't know if there was any other comments you had or thoughts. No, I think you you, you covered the uh, the need. Yeah, the other piece I'll just share with you that we are do have we have out for E rate, and it's part of our replacement cycle is access points. So the big picture on access points is every three years we replace the access points at the green school, junior high, and high school, and we can get forty percent back on those. And then what we do is we take the access points that are only three years old at those three buildings, and we reallocate them down to the K fours. So we're working on that too. And Charlie and his team and Encore have been very helpful with help understanding our replacement cycle, but trying to work it into this budget and time frame. As you know, sometimes those are a little bit of a, a challenge. Uh, and my E-rate, I don't want to give you two in the weeds, but E-rate has this window of opportunity. You've got to get it all put to bed by the end of March. That's when you got to get your bids in. You got to wait 28 days. And then you can start encumbering that money and getting it put aside for you for July purchases. That's part of the federal uh, government program. And it's based upon our free and reduced lunch number. Our free and reduced lunch number, let's say it's about 15%. It maps to 40% back in our funds. Cincinnati Public Schools, they're getting 90% back on their telephony and their switches and such. So just trying to give you some of this as you think through the construction projects and how we're trying to walk that path. And I can understand that, you know, as we're doing new construction, that we're significantly expanding the footprint of that building, and this would be a good time to do it. Mr. Evans did ask a question, like, are we bumping anywhere near the bandwidth capacity on, on the lines that are in there? Uh, actually, we're upgrading our fiber as well. So we're putting, we've got our fiber, there's different types of fiber we can get into technically, but we've actually upgraded the fiber. So we are not, uh, Mr. Mercurial, we also have, when you think about, you think about it as plumbing, right? You, you've got out at the street, maybe you've got a fire hose that's about three or four inch diameter. It comes into the building and it squishes down to maybe a one inch diameter. 
you know, what we've done is we've got a nice pipe out of the street coming into our building. And then between our tech closets, we actually have expanded that pipe. So it's, it's a much uh, more fluid, a much given us much more bandwidth between our tech closets. A lot of time you and I may feel as though I really am not getting a whole lot of bandwidth. It could be the tech closet right down the hall from you isn't really uh, up to par with their technology. So we've actually switched out some of the switches or newer switches on the end. That's why we're always looking at every eight years. What about those switch capacities uh, or capacity of a switch, I should say. Just like maybe you go out and buy a router in your house and you're like, yeah, I bought a, an 800 meg router. Now they're 1.2 or three gig router I can get, which gives me more bandwidth in my house even to do. So hopefully I'm making that, some sense with yeah, it. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. But is that what's going on at Sims right now? That's what the, these monies are for, is to upgrade that. They are, John, they are to upgrade and also then stay in alignment with all the other upgrades we're moving to. And as I shared with you just a moment ago, we really try to five through 12 space, always be on the latest and widest bandwidth, if I can call it that, and then reallocate. Though that's, a, that's always been our, our motto on the AP side, access point side. So, so can I ask a question, more an accounting question? So the, the rebates that we, the E-rate rebates that we might get, how does that, Beth, how do we account for that? Does that go back against what we're spending in this proposal for the, the I'm just gonna call it IT upgrades for lack of a better characterization. How does that, how is that handled accounting wise? Mrs. Weiss, what we will do is we will um, charge those costs that would be included in the project to the E-rate dollars and uh, the funds that had been expensed from the bond issue account would go back into the bond issue. Okay. So they, be, they, so they could be used for other contingencies or um, for other projects. So we, we would do that. And, and I believe that those turn around Mr. Fritz within probably about a, a within the year that the funds are, are um, after when we apply for them. Is that correct? They are. And so immediately when we uh, encumber those dollars and purchase that equipment, we can immediately turn around and, and refund. So what is nice, you get a funding commitment decision letter from e rate that says we put aside the money for you. When you spend it, you then turn in all your bills and you get reimbursed at that rate. So that's kind of whenever that happens. And what we're trying to look at is over the next year, July 1 to September of next year, we're trying to look at, we're going to be in the midst of, we're going to need switches. We're going to need all these buildings as we get upgraded. And we also want to be cognizant of um, the type of switch. We don't want to buy two different switches. We want to be consistent on our switches so they work correctly. And as you know, technology is a moving target. <laughs> so we're trying to look at all that together. And also for balance, I think, with the usage, or, you know, if there's no demand for the increased technology, you know, we need to go through the effort. That's kind of, that's what I was trying to understand. I do understand the phones and all that. Yes. Mobility at that level being different than, than playing Wi-Fi in the classroom. I think my other question is just around the budget. I know, you know, SHP and Mr. Lewis, et cetera, have done a great job of um, bringing in savings, you know, and keeping to drive the savings. You know, one school thought would be let's just return that savings back into the community um, as opposed to redeploying it. In this case, we decided to, it sounds like, pull forward our CapEx budget from the future and get some of these things out of the way. Are we going to see that tracked in the CapEx budget going into the future where that technology fund of $800,000 is now $700,000 or $600,000? I, you okay, I'll, I'll answer that if you don't mind, Mrs. Weber, talk a little bit about it. So the 800,000 uh, 800, every year is really part of our one-to-one -one program. And, and I, I hate uh, to put it in that bucket. It may yeah, be different yeah. But I would say that Mrs. Weber and I have been talking as I have a 10-year kind of forecast of we don't want to build all the houses at the same time, right? Or buy all the buses like you all talk about at the same year. So we're looking at we were saying, when do we want to pull and do that? And we're right at the edge of our end of life of our current switches. So it just worked really well. The 800,000, that capital improvement budget is really spent a lot of our one-to-one -one program, keeping up other 
uh, labs in the district as well, across the district. So those are kind of pieces that have always been accounted for. The last time we did a switch upgrade, eight or nine years ago, I believe Mrs. Weber and I set even additional dollars aside because it's kind of those one-offs. You know, you don't do it every year and it's not part of that standard 800,000. Hopefully I answered yeah, that kind of, thank you. yeah. So that does lead to a question for me, yeah. Mr. Fritz and, and Mrs. Weber, the capital forecast that we have for the next, that's in the, if you mentioned three different buildings, we would have future work on this, Mont Montgomery, Blue Ash and Mapledale. And you, I, I think it was on, on the order of magnitude of about a half a million dollars. Montgomery, Montgomery Blue Ash and um, Mapledale will all need switch upgrades. And so my question is, is that already in the capital forecast that we have gotten, or is that going to be an increase to the capital forecast that we have gotten? That number we're going to get back when I get back all my bids here in the next uh, 28 days. And that number, when you parse it out and take off the 40%, that's something we haven't actually identified to talk about how much of that needs to be in the, the capital. Or can I get the remainder of that out of the $800,000? I'm working to try to get that out of the $800,000 that I know that every year comes along with our capital. Okay, so we're not clear yet if it's gonna be an increase from our, I'm just asking, is, yeah, is no. it currently in the forecast? And it sounds like it's not. It, it isn't, but I, uh, Mr. Comerford, what I was trying to look at is fitting that underneath, because it's only three of our buildings, fitting that underneath what we have left, trying to stretch that $800,000 so we don't ask, come back to you and ask you for any dollars in that area, okay. if that makes sense. And, and just to clarify, I believe the additional cost wasn't just in the, the as Mr. Fitz terms it, the switches. It was also a complete uh, upgrade of wiring at Sims, which I don't believe would be necessary at the other three buildings. Is that? That's correct. That correct? That is correct. And I, I don't have the, the allocation that went for that, but it, it sounds like it's a, it's a little bit different um, expense needed to bring those up to, up to code or up to standard going forward in the other three elementary buildings compared to Sims. That is correct. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm trying to make sure we get it underneath the 800,000 with our only three buildings having to do the switches. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Thank you all very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Could I just clarify, was that Mr. Comerford that that made the motion. I believe Mr. Mercurio seconded. Uh, Mr. Ballant and then Ms. and seconded by Mr. Mercurio. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ballant? Aye. Mr. Mercurio? Aye. Mr. Evans? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. And Mr. Comerford? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of the authorization to bid for district paving projects. So moved. Second. David. Mr. Lewis, thank you for your leadership on this. <clears throat> this is an easy one. So um, I'm very proud of the work that we've done as a district to really keep up with our paving. Um, you know, when I first came to the district, we were spending on average of 250, 260 a year um, to be able to get our, our parking lots really caught up. So, um, you know, I, I feel like our consultants really have to get out there and you know, now they, they don't have as much to bring back to us. And with so many buildings under construction, um, this, this is, represents a pretty small amount of paving, but the majority of this paving is focused at Blue Ash Elementary, which it's just time. Uh, it's time to do an overlay there. And, um, you know, that's the majority of the work. There's some other work at um, Montgomery. There's some small work at Montgomery. Uh, there's some small work crack ceiling and things at Mapledale, and then a little bit at the board office. But overall, the majority of the work is at Blue Ash Elementary. Uh, we are going to ask to take an alternate just for pricing. Montgomery needs some similar work, but Blue Ash is in worse shape than Montgomery. So um, if the budget were the budget of 148,000, we're able to sustain picking up some additional work at Montgomery, we would do that. 
Um, but if not, then we certainly will be planning for that for next year. So um, again, we, we are keeping up with everything, but the other four buildings that are under construction, there is no need to do any of the paving because it's part of the construction project. So uh, for a few years here, that's all you'll see from me on paving is just um, some recommendations about uh, the three buildings and the, uh, I'll say the accessory building of the board office that would be recommendations. So that's where we're at with paving. All right, thank you, Mr. Lewis. Any questions from the board? Thank you for keeping us on track with this. Um, all right, Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Okay, just to clarify, Mr. Mercurio made the motion. Yes. And, and Mr. Mr. Comerford seconded? No, Mr. Evans. Evans. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Mercurio? Aye. Mr. Evans? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. And Mr. Comerford? Uh, Motion passes. Mr. Forstoffel. Just briefly, um, I think it's in these times important to recognize uh, some Herculean efforts of, that may not get recognized by the community. So one such event took place on Saturday evening. As you know, we had some dicey weather in the community. We had a boys basketball team that was at Western Hills, and they had to travel back to the district in some tricky weather. So I want to thank publicly the bus driver, Amy Turner, who did an amazing job ensuring our students were safe and our coaches were safe to get back. Those are things that you guys probably don't see or hear about on the weekends as we monitor all that, and make decisions about who goes where and not goes where. Um, but, I, but I need the community to know that we take every one of those trips very seriously and make individual decisions based on the students uh, and, and staff health and safety. So Mrs. Turner, I want to know she's not on, obviously, but I want to thank her publicly for her work and keeping our kids safe. So that's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Forshoffel. All right, moving on to the treasurer's agenda. Mrs. Weber. Okay, Mr. Lewis, if you could go to the next slide, please. Okay, um, many of you may be aware and you may not be aware that um, about a week ago, Governor DeWine um, issued an executive order that was, was beneficial to our district um, in that he uh, had reevaluated re the financial status of the state and had found that there was an opportunity to be able to reinstate some of the funding reductions that had been made um, across the state in, in, for this current fiscal year, um, which began July 1st. Um, one of the things that he reinstated, and it's the primary place that he reinstated um, funding cuts, was into K-12 education. And um, based on that executive order, um, we uh, had originally estimated we were going to have about a $562,000 uh, reduction in our state funding formula dollars. Um, that has now been changed to right, right around a little over $250,000. So that was really good news uh, that those dollars have been brought back into um, the district budget for, for this year. Um, this week also, um, on February 1, the governor introduced his biennium budget. So that would be for the, the two years beginning this upcoming July. Um, in that budget, he uh, has projected that he would reinstate all cuts that have been made over the last two years. Um, so that would really, thinking about it though, that would bring us back to the level of funding that we received in 2018-19. So still very flat um, budget for the district. That's not totally unusual for uh, Sycamore, but uh, that, that's where it stands at this point within the budget, governor's recommendation. Um, he's planning to continue student success and wellness funding, which is some dollars right now. We're getting about $270,000 this year. Um, I've not seen a projection for future years, but I think it's going to increase just a bit um, in the upcoming fiscal year. Those dollars are to be used for uh, support wraparound services uh, for student mental health things like that. Um, and we utilize those for programming that we ha already had existing in the district. We did not add programming, but we were able to fund some really great programs that we already had in place. Um, I, I will say that while um, the governor's budget doesn't have 
anything new for the funding formula. It, one of the comments that he made is that both the House and the Senate have been looking at their own school funding uh, formula changes, and he's going to leave it up to them to figure that out. They've been doing the work. They've been um, keeping on top of that. And, and uh, actually, the House actually had a proposal that they approved back in, in December that didn't make it through the Senate. So um, while it's flat for right now, I think we're going to have to continue really monitoring that um, in this upcoming upcoming budget cycle that's that's now underway. So he's governor's provided his uh, his proposal. It'll now go to um, the House for them to to uh, update. Uh, from a federal funding standpoint, um, I mentioned, I believe, in our last meeting that we had um, some additional COVID relief that has been approved back in December. Um, it's about $1.3 million that can be used for any costs that were that assisted us with providing um, supports due to um, the COVID, COVID pandemic. And those expenses can go all the way back to March of 2020. We would probably, we could potentially look at, at costs that would go probably back to July 1 of this year. We would be able to keep it within our fiscal year if we decided to go that way. Um, and they can be used through September of 2022. So um, a pretty broad window of when those dollars can be used to help us support any of those efforts. Um, we have not, we've been, we've been really focused the last couple of weeks on vaccination. So as a team, we haven't had an opportunity yet to really talk about um, the best uses for these funds, but we will keep the board up to date as we make um, as we as we look through those recommendations going forward. Are there any questions? I have, I have one. I you know I think we were unique as a district to kind of upfront the costs for COVID and really take care of our staff and our community and our students with a significant amount of money from our cash reserve. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm hoping one of the Alec considered allocations is is to kind of reimburse that that upfronting of that money. I think it was mentioned by Mr. Evans and Mrs. Weiss and Mr. Comerford last time. I, I agree. I don't even know why we I think that ought to be the first thing that if we need to spend more it should go to our normal for some part of the budgeting process. Okay. I mean if that's the if that's the um, recommendation of the board I think that's it's appropriate and the way it was set up does allow that to occur. So we could go and what we would likely do is just utilize those for some of those remaining costs that we still have um, going forward from this point um, for those staff that we already have in place that, that supported the program. So that's helpful. Do you need a motion from the board on that one? No, um, because but um, what we will do is when I bring that forward as part of the treasurer's consent agenda, once it's approved, um, there will be an appropriation increase at that point in time. And at, we'll just make sure that that is um, noted within that, if that, if that works for the, for the board. I think we would look at that. We'll be looking at that at the February evening meeting, Mrs. Weber. Um, I will have to find out if the application is, a, is available yet from ODE for us to get ODE's approval yet. And I think that's supposed to come out by the end of the month. So it more likely, more likely it'll be the March evening meeting. Okay. Is everyone okay with that? Just so yeah. that not, okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Mrs. Weber. Any other questions? All right, uh, moving on. I need a motion for the approval of the personnel consent agenda. So moved, Paul. Second, Dick, Dave. Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mr. Ballard? Aye. Mr. Evans? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. And Mr. Mercurio? Aye. 
Motion passes. Moving on to other Board of Education business. Strategic planning update, Mr. Forstoffel. Yeah, I'd be happy to give a quick update. Uh, as you know, the board approved um, the strategic plan moving forward in January. Now our work begins on forming our project leadership teams around our year one priorities. And I'll remind you what those are. Curriculum reporting, data analysis, building leader support and culture development. So we've had conversations this week and we'll have more this week with LEI who will assist us and guide us through the formation and the composition of those project leadership teams. Because remember now that the task of those teams are to develop strategies and measurables for those two one priorities moving forward. So we have another call Friday afternoon um, and we will be actually assigned a specific consultant from LAI who has vast experience in project management. So that'll be a good thing and somebody that we're comfortable with. So um, as these teams are developed, uh, uh, we will certainly bring that in the loop and Ms. Mercurio as the liaison to the board will keep you a little closer and then we can figure out how we might keep it. Okay. Let me know if you might need to participate. I can do that. All right, thank you. So good, good work. Great, thank you very much. Okay, moving on to the superintendent search update. Um, as I mentioned last week, uh, you can get more information about this on the school board website. There's an icon of a person standing at a podium titled Superintendent Search. So far, we have had over 300 superintendent search profile questionnaires completed. And this um, tomorrow, on February 4th, there will be uh, Zoom forums in which members of the Sycamore community can share their input related to the skills, characters, and experience that they want to see in our next superintendent. So we are moving along with that. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add about that. I think that's pretty complete. All right, um, anything else, Mr. Forstoff? I have nothing. Anyone else on the board? All right, I need a motion to go into executive session in accordance with, oh. I'm sorry, oh. I have one question. Sure. Um, supplemental review. Oh. So we will provide that information to you to the board to review. Oh, okay. Or formatting it right. All right, thank you, Kevin. Um, I need a motion to go into executive session in accordance with ORC 121.22G1 employment dismissal evaluation appointment compensation and discipline of a public employee official or regulated individual, and in accordance with ORC 121.22G4 negotiations. So moved, Paul. Second. Mrs. Weber. Mr. Ballot. Aye. Mr. Evans? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Mr. Mercurio? Aye. And Mrs. Wife? Aye. We do not expect, do we, do we do not expect a vote um, after executive session. Yeah. So thank you everyone for participating. Have a nice day. Aye, everybody. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. I'll take a five, 10 minute break. Thank you for uh, Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.